Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, guys. Wow. Oh. The slide is blank. That's interesting. Yeah, there we go. So that title, The Perfect Relationship, posed a bit of a dilemma for me. I found it to be a pickle, a conundrum, something. Because when I looked at it, I thought, what, how can I approach this from a way that, from a perspective that is, that is broadly appealing and applicable? Because I always want the messages I deliver to be relevant to anyone who listens to them. So as I thought about it, the perfect relationship, I thought, well, do I take the obvious and maybe the easy route and just talk about one's relationship with God? I could do that. Then again, I did that last week. <laughs> and some of you might notice if I repeat the exact same message, so maybe not that. Then I thought, well, then do I talk about my relationship with Corey, which is pretty darn good, awesome even, but do I dare hold it up as perfect? Or do I... Talk about the other relationships, all the relationships in my life. So I was kind of whirling around with that most of the week, and then I, was, then I have to consider you then, you who are here listening, you who ever listen to this message, you who are a part of this community, and you are the ones with whom I share my, my revelation, my experiences, my beliefs, my practices. And what I know about you is that there's all sorts of different experiences of relationships in this community. Some of you are in kind of those primary life mate kinds of relationships. Some of you are not. Those of you who are in them, of those, some of you would rather not be. <laughs> hmm. And some of you really like it and want to stay. Of those of you who aren't, some of you would love to be in one like that. And some of you don't want to be or are, have no interest. So it's like it's all over the board. So um, that was my dilemma in how to, how to approach a title like The Perfect Relationship. And then um, as I was kind of struggling with this. On Thursday morning, I had a prayer call with a prayer partner. And in the middle of that time when we were praying for each other, kind of the, the, the message, the point that, that I wanted to, to explore with you this morning was all of a sudden revealed, like Reverend Richard talked about having that vision in the Wednesday service a couple of weeks ago. The idea, the one point that I wanted to share with you was it sort of just came to me in all of its glory and power and really simplicity. And that is this, that the perfect relationship is the one you're looking at now. Whatever that relationship is, and we all have relationships in our life, whether they're personal and primary or whether they're not, that applies to any relationship at all. The perfect relationship is the one that you're considering right now. So some context for this kind of idea of perfect. In this faith, in Ernest Holmes's concept of perfection or perfect, he said perfect is, is lacking nothing essential to the whole, complete. That is certainly true of God. And what we believe here is that what is true of God is true of God's creation because God created the universe from itself. So the truth of God is the truth of God's creation. That means that everything is lacking nothing essential to the whole. Everything is complete right now just the way that it is. So what that means for us in any relationship we consider in our lives, personal, impersonal, interpersonal, professional, whatever they are, it means that those relationships are exactly the way they're supposed to be. They are exactly the way they need to be. They are exactly the way that they ought to be for our own evolution and unfoldment. Those of you who are distressed by this idea, just breathe. Because that's every relationship, every, every relationship that you can consider in your life. So they are necessary to our own evolution and our own unfoldment. And how can I say that? Well, this is where it gets really good and maybe sometimes a little bit icky. <laughs> Um, for us, because when we stand in front of a mirror, this is from Ernest Holmes, it reflects our image automatically, does it not? The reflection is identical and completely corresponds with the object in front of it. The reflection in the mirror did not put itself there. We cannot rub it out. We could deny it or affirm its opposite or will or wish or pray or supplicate it to go away, but as long as we stand in front of the mirror, that object will be exactly reflected. However, as the object changes, the reflection changes. It is just that way in our lives and in our experiences. The object is our thought. The mirror is as the law of mind. If there are those things in our lives which not, ought not to be, 
They are what we have given to the law of mind, and we are receiving back their correspondence or their reflections. So we have to get busy and change the object, the pattern of our own thinking, our inward state of awareness. In a long nutshell, that talks about the idea that our life happens from the inside out. The experiences of our lives are a reflection of what's going on inside. So if, and, and then in uh, the Science of Mind textbook, Ernest Holmes says, if one sees only unloveliness in others, it is because unloveliness is a strong element in himself. The light he throws on others is generated in his own soul, and he sees them as he chooses to see them. The perfect relationship is the one that you're looking at now. The mirror does not reflect back what we wish, what we hope, what we pray, what we want to be. The mirror of our life reflects back what we are right now. The preponderance of our thoughts and our expectancy and our belief and our acceptance. That's what it does. And so if I look out and I see unloveliness, as Ernest Holmes said in The Science of Mind, it's because I'm contemplating that in myself. I have thoughts of unloveliness, whatever that looks like in your life. So before all of this mirror talk, I, I, I said that every relationship in our life is perfect, it is complete, it is necessary and present for our own evolution and our old un own unfoldment. So the mirror of my life, the experiences of my life reflect back to me, can give me information, can give me input, can give me data about what is going on in my consciousness. And really, it's what's going on just below the level of my awareness. Because if I'm aware that I'm thinking things and believing things and expecting things that aren't, aren't pleasant for me, if I'm aware of that, I will most likely change that. But if I'm not quite aware of it, but it's really moving in the subjective part of my mind, then those experiences can give me some insight. And then I can make adjustments. I can do some cleanup along the way and if it's necessary to do that. Um, and, and I'm talking about, as I've said repeatedly already, I'm talking about every relationship in our lives. That is our primary, if you have one, if you have a life mate, family, friends, coworkers, bosses, strangers, groups, politicians, <laughs> events, conditions, natural disasters. When we're talking about relationships, we're talking about exchanges of energy. You have relationships with all this and more. Because you either interact with them or it, you think about it, you exchange energy, you have some opinion about it. That's all relationship. And when we think of it and look at it and go, these are the relationships of my life, how am I contemplating them? How am I regarding them? And if we want a better world, is there anyone who doesn't? Does anybody think that the world's as good as it needs to be? We're part of an organization whose vision is a world that works for everyone. I don't think we're there yet. So if we want that, if we want a better world, then maybe beginning to, to develop healthier relationships is a good start. Seems to me that's a, a pretty good start. So if, if the mirror in your life, if the experiences that you are having are reflecting something that you're not happy with, of course the work begins within. It always does. And so a great and simple guide for a way to begin is explained in a book that's now called Basic Ideas of Science of Mind. This book, it's now a book, but it was actually a, like a, uh, an annual edition of the Science of Mind magazine, clear back in 1957. Uh, they, put, they would put out an annual edition of the magazine, and that was it. And now it's called Basic Ideas of the Science of Mind. And so this is a really wonderful exercise, a really wonderful how-to in moving in that direction for making healthier and happier relationships in our life. Ernest Holmes said, you are a child of God, and therefore you should have a very high opinion of yourself. No foolish self-conceit, but a reverent understanding of your wondrous relationship with God. Tell yourself over and over again that the quality of love lies within you, and that it is only natural for you to be expressing it. Think first of those whom you love because of their nearness and dearness to you. Dwell upon their good qualities. Think of them by name and specify some admirable traits they possess. Kindle within your emotions a warm glow of feeling about them. Now, remember that all other people are just as truly worthy of your love and are in need of it if they are to expand into finer and more beautiful ways of living. They need your love. Spend a few minutes with thoughts of love for all the world, 
It is sorely in need of every bit of help you can furnish, and love is its greatest need. This is not mere idle wishing. It is a definite service you can render. Your thoughts of love to humankind carry a blessing to humankind to the far corners of the globe. Do not neglect to exercise this privilege. This is so true. I hope you hear at the end, he's like, he's, he's very clear and very passionate about the idea that our work in consciousness is very real. Our contemplations, our, our expressions of love within our own mind and, and, and hearts, our expressions of love to those whom we treasure, to those that we don't know, to the whole world, it's good work. Just like prayer, it's very real and it's very necessary. And if we but did that, if we did that kind of thing, if we dwell on love, Love for all of humanity, that is a contemplation of the truth of God because God is love. So the more that we individually spend time together dwelling on the idea of love and then sending that blessing out to the far corners of the globe, the more that we dwell on it, the more we're going to dwell in it. The more we praise it, the more we raise it. It's a beautiful thing and it's a very important work that we do in consciousness. Just imagine with me a world where more and more people not just those of us who are here right now, but more than that, twice as many, five times as many, a million times as many people spent time on a daily basis just contemplating love. Love of, of, of our, our higher self, love of God, love of humankind, love of the planet. This is really what, what Jesus was teaching when he, when he talked about the idea that the first and greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, with all your mind with all your soul and then the second greatest the second greatest commandment was to love your neighbor as yourself that's what we're talking about creating a world that works for everyone contemplating love for each other that's an amazing thing so in that regard there are three things to consider um, in changing how you relate to those other others the other people the other groups the other situations in your life. And maybe these three things you can do after you spend some contemplative time loving them, loving yourself and loving them. So the first, this is treat your spouse, but treat the other, treat the other person, friend, coworker, group, situation as if you love them with your last breath, no matter how contrary to that you might feel at any moment, right? So in, in a moment where you're feeling especially like not loving, do your best to, to treat that other with as much love as you can muster. Sometimes we say in this teaching and practice, fake it till you make it, right? It's not being disingenuous because love is at the center of you. It's at the center of me. It's always at the center of us. We lose sight of it sometimes, and that's okay. But if we can begin this practice, this is a pretty bold practice, but if we can do that, we're going to begin to experience more love in our life. Another idea, think hard every day about how to make their life worth living. You're not going to live for them, but that they are somehow inspired or motivated to live more fully because you're in their life. That's a wonderful way of, of being in relationship. Or be the kind of person that you want to come home, or that you want to love, hug, come home to, or sacrifice for. Be the person that you want to shower all of that love on. Be that kind of person. Those are just simple but very powerful and sometimes not very easy things to do to begin to express this idea of love in any relationship. The relationship that you're considering right now is the perfect one, the perfect one to do this work with. I imagine this on a global scale and it feels so good to imagine that people would be doing this, that people could be practicing this together. And obviously, I'm aware that these ideas and suggestions are not new. Probably everybody in here has heard something like this at some point in their life. But I have a, a thing that let's maybe agree to. Let's pretend like these ideas and suggestions are the first time that we've ever heard them and that they're the greatest ideas we've ever heard and we can't wait to implement them. Is that all right? Yeah. Sure, why not? It's like everything old is new again. So let's start that again. This teaching is based on ancient principles. People have known this throughout time. And as we forget, we just remind ourselves. To support and inspire, um, I have another piece from Ernest Holmes this is in a book called, it's now a book called Living the Science of Mind. It was an old home study course that he had produced. But he said this, if the philosophy of Christianity were lived, that philosophy of love God fully and then love your neighbor as yourself, if this philosophy were lived, wars would cease 
unhappiness would cease. Economic problems would be solved. Poverty would be wiped from the face of the earth. And man's inhumanity to man would be transmuted into a spirit of mutual helpfulness. If this idea, if that pure and powerful idea of love were lived, fully lived, those ideas of inequality, disenfranchisement, poverty, hunger, violence, that would all be wiped out. And we would be living more closely in a world that works for everyone and for all of creation. Because we are back to the pure essence of God. And as we transform our individual relationships, we begin to see the world around us start to change. And then those transformed relationships become holy hotspots for, for, that, for that to expand. I found a piece from The Course in Miracles that said, the holiest of all the spots on earth is where an ancient hatred has become a present love. An ancient hatred has become a present love. Maybe you don't feel ancient, but in ourselves, we have, I mean, that might be a little hyperbolic, but ancient hatred. So my invitation to you and to me and to us this week is why don't we practice sp spreading some present love on earth this week? And then we can bear witness as our world becomes a better place. I'm all for that. I trust that you might take this invitation and love the people that you're around this week in a greater way. Practice that present love and the world around us will change for the better. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, let's see. Oh, yeah, so we're going to uh, move into the sharing of our tithes and offerings. We're going to do that first, and then we'll um, have some more information to share. Um, so, where's mine? There it is. So we give. We give consciously in this faith and philosophy. We give intentionally. The intention to, to celebrate the supply of God, to celebrate the, the presence of God, the, the, the bounty of God, to support this ministry and its vision and mission in the world, to support our local community because we return a, a percentage of what you give to our local partners every month and to our denomination, 10%. Every week we send, we tithe to our denomination so that Centers for Spiritual Living can continue to expand our work our vision of creating a world that works for everyone. And so I invite you, as you choose to give today, to bless your gift with all your heart, just to know that it's the substance of God that you share freely and joyfully with this community. If you give other than right now here to this community, if you auto-tithe, if you give another way to this community, use your connection card to just really infuse it with that blessing of, of uh, abundance and supply and circulation. We're going to give that silent blessing, and then we'll send the gifts on their way. So it is.
that we'll be reaching for a dream. Think of all the dreams that could come true. Yes, if the hands we're reaching with could come together, joining me and you. When it comes to thinking of tomorrow, Well, that was fairly perfect. <laughs> Great choice. Thank you very much for that. Michelle, don't sit down. Okay, stand back up. <laughs> uh, hey, it's Oktoberfest. <laughs> this time in October. Huh? This time in October, which is awesome. Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm not sick this time. That's right. <laughs> Hi, look, look today. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> So good morning, and um, actually that song is really perfect because right now, at the same time, Reverend Connie is giving her second Sunday service talk for the first time in um, Kenya. So this, um, in October, she started actual service. So that's a huge accomplishment for over there. Yay. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm with uh, the Global Heart Connection here at the center. And today is our um, October luncheon. This is the luncheon that we use to finish up our tithe. We have a $200 a month tithe to Reverend Connie because she can't actually work in Kenya. And so um, she needs churches to support her in order to be able to do the work. And our center does huge work in Nairobi, huge work. So please come and join us. The food over there smells good, tastes good. We have apple strudel for dessert. That is really good. We tried that. Um, <laughs> and uh, all of the money, 100% of the money, goes totally to um, Kenya to support um, the school there and the um, center. She has like a bazillion students right now. I mean, really a significant number of students for um, such a a new country to new thought. So I think it's like 30 when you add it up. So that's huge, Science of Mind students there. And this um, church there is a Science of Mind school. So that's huge. All right, so it's $10, five if there are um, children under 12. 
So this was our drive. Remember, we sold books and um, gathered books. Uh, so there are um, the three green suitcases. Whoops, back up. The three green suitcases are Connie's um, personal stuff, and the rest are books, um, science of mind class books. She's starting practitioner training. Those were practitioner books. The donations from here and children's books. So we spent $1,600 sending eight boxes of books um, over to Kenya. And so next slide now, there's the library. So those are the, on the floor, those are the new books. Those are the practitioner books that she needs for her students. And next slide. Um, those are just the Science of Mind class books that she has now. Bear in mind, because this next slide's important, these are the books for sale. So those other books, they, they cannot take because there's such a limited number of books. That's why we get practitioner books, Science of Mind books for them, because they can only borrow the books. So now we have two shelves of books that they can purchase and underline and keep for themselves and they're so excited. All right, and the next one, this is very funny. I hope you can see that really well. This is Alfred. And so Connie, um, he's a science of mind student and he also happens to be her gardener. And there's a whole story behind how Alfred um, found them, etc. And so while she was here, she said, I have to get him one of those garden hoses. You know the flat ones? Because they don't weigh so much. So that was one of the things in her green suitcase and she got a spray nozzle. So <laughs> Connie sent this and I said, ooh, wow, that looks like the Maasai tribe, the way he just kind of wound that around there. Is that like a thing? She goes, he didn't want to get it dirty. <laughs> <laughs> so Alfred is so proud of his new hose <laughs> that he wraps it because it's so long and he doesn't want to get it dirty. <laughs> I just think that's so funny. <laughs> All right, <laughs> so this is the work that we do in Kenya. We are her main supporters. She is so overly um, grateful for the work that we do here at this center um, to support and make it um, possible for her to do the work over there. Please join us for the luncheon. The money is gonna go um, to the students' luncheons. We're feeding 21 children now. Um, that's the only meal that they get six days a week. And we're also supporting so that she can continue to do Conscious Connections with Connie. That's the name of her <laughs> service. So thank you. The food's great. Come on over. Yeah. And today there's a new way of getting access to the great room. You're going to go through the open glass wall. It's open, so don't worry about it. Just, you know. You'll see there's signs pointing you to the way. Our main door to the great room broke yesterday. You'll see a big crack in it today. Uh, this is going to be quite the replacement. So if you feel moved and motivated, we'll certainly accept gratefully your donations to replace the door. Uh, that's gonna, we're going to start working on that tomorrow. All right. Today, also, this is a center for spiritual living, which means there are choices to make. So one of the choices is kind of an interesting one. Today we're at 1145. We're going to have a gathering in here. It's our monthly I Am Enough gathering. It is your opportunity to just come into a safe and encouraging environment where we can talk about the idea of sufficiency and supply. There is enough. I am enough. I have enough. Whatever that kind of idea is or the opposite of that, if you're focused on that, if you're working with that in your life, I invite you to join me at 1145. We go till about 1 o'clock, and that is um, free. There's no charge for that today. So that's uh, right after the service, uh, well, a little, little bit of time after the service ends. Um, the interfaith forums, the annual fall interfaith forums, continue tonight. Um, I happen to be on the panel tonight, so I would love to have you there to hear me talk about how my faith tradition works with other traditions to heal the world. It's the idea of, you know, the disenfranchisement, the inequality, the violence in the world. How is, how are Centers for Spiritual Living working with other traditions to help maybe change that and make a, make a better world? Uh, these are beautifully conceived and moderated experiences. There are, I think, six of us on the panel tonight. Uh, the event tonight is at Bishop Gorman over on South Wallapai. Um, it starts at 7 o'clock. There's refreshments afterwards, and it's really a wonderful way of just coming together in a spirit of cooperation and understanding. Nobody's going to try to convert you 
uh, to their way of thinking. We just share uh, our own uh, faith traditions, perspectives. And so there's a brochure in the lobby that will show you the rest of the series. In fact, in two weeks from today, on November 5th, we are hosting uh, a, a forum and uh, one of our youth, one of our teens, Kaylee Marshall, is going to be on the panel. So that's going to be very exciting, and you'll be invited to show up in large numbers for that. So that's in two weeks. Um, October's book of the month over in the bookstore is by Don Miguel Ruiz. It's called The Mastery of Love. It is really about relationships and not just a sole primary relationship. It's about all the relationships in your life and how they are based in and how you can practice them in a greater way uh, with love, the love that God is and the love that you are. Wednesday night, we have a service. I invite Bobby to come forward. Uh, he is part of the team that puts together this fourth Wednesday. It's really a wonderful experience, and let's hear about it. Hi. Hi. You know, talking about unconditional love is sometimes rather difficult, so on the way here, I suggested to Judy, what do you think unconditional love would look like in our home? She said it would look like you saying yes. <laughs> so, so if you'd like to learn more about how to say that in a humble way come on out Wednesday night Thanks. <laughs> mm. and that is at 7 p.m. here it's preceded at 5.30 for an hour with dinner you get soup or other things last week we had pizza and there was a pasta dish it was all sorts of wonderful stuff a dollar a serving, and that is on Wednesday from 5.30 to 6.30. That's an awesome thing to uh, avail yourself of before they delight us with Bobby just saying yes all evening and Judy leading the way. So that'll be, that'll be great. <laughs> um, yeah. There's a class coming up that also starts the first Sunday of November. It's called The Path to Wealth. It's based on Mae McCarthy's book of the same name. Our Reverend Laura Hallett has created an entire seven-week curriculum on, based on that book and on Mae McCarthy's workshop uh, based on the book. It is not, if you've read the book, as we did together a couple years ago, it's not only about money. It is about living a fully involved, fully engaged, successful life on all levels. And I promise you it's going to be a magnificent experience. Today is the last Sunday that we're going to accept that we can have you register because we have to order the materials from May for the class and so it's to be sold in the bookstore, the book, a workbook and a journal. So um, please go to the Empower You table this morning out in the lobby, get, the, get this uh, registration form and sign up for the class. I plan to take the class um, because I want to just really remind myself of that wonderful work that May took that May uh, wrote and, and lives, um, and I invite you to do the same. It's going to be seven weeks starting November 5th uh, from 12.30 to 2.30 on Sundays. The tuition is only $50. It's one of the least expensive classes we offer, but it will be of Im immense value to you, I promise you. It's going to be great. So that's coming up in a couple weeks. And then next week, if you want there to be food, we're not going to have anything left over from the Oktoberfest. So next week, if your last name has this uh, alphabet salad, F, L, R, V, or W, if it begins with that, it's the fifth Sunday, consider bringing something to eat or drink to share in our fellowship time after the service. Or if you just feel the call, if you think of your Saturday morning or Sunday or sometime, you're like, oh, I should bring something for after service. Please do that, because that'll be wonderful. That's how we support ourselves in the great room after service with our company and our food. So thank you for that. All right, we're going to finish the service as we always do with prayer. Yes. Oh, it's on there. It was on there too. Next Sunday is uh, our Halloween Sunday. Ooh. Yes, if you don't know, we do dress up. Many of us do. I forgot. Oh, yeah, that too. It's, I, you know what? It's on the back side. A bit, uh, well, you're, you're the... It's, yeah, it's right here. See? Theo, gourmets for God. Um, so, so next Sunday, come in costume. We have a little parade around the sanctuary. We have a contest. There's prizes. Woohoo! So be creative. Be more creative than Teresa. That'll be hard. But, you know, it happens. Um, so anyway, that's next Sunday. It's only once a year. Believe me, I pray for it to be over. Every year. Um, <laughs> Mary's like, oh. Anyway. She loves it. She has fun with it, don't you? She does. Theo Ann Burns, would you please come forward? You will. Here we come. Yes. Bringing up the rear is Theo Burns. Okay. As you, for, as you, as you already know, we love to eat around oh. here. What? What? 
good Lord, she has three pages. I know, it's all very confusing. Judy gives me these. And oh. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, first of all, you got this, so please read it before you recycle it, okay? All right, Gourmets for God is a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's two parts. First of all, the host. We need hosts. When you host something, and I have co-host, and I am hosting this this year, um, you have an event in your home, or maybe in the Great Room, or at Mount Charleston, or Lake Mead, or Red Rock, or anywhere, and you host it. And it should be something that you like to do and you want to share with everybody else. Okay, so it says, looking for hosts to plan one or more events around food, food that takes place between January, 20, January 2018 and July 2018. It may be one person, a couple, a group of people. It doesn't have to be fancy. It can be simple, a barbecue, hamburgers, Ice cream is always good, or it can be elegant, as you wish. There, and if you note, outside, there will be a couple people, a couple of us at the Gourmet for God table, and we have ideas, and if you come by and talk to us, um, we will hand you a form and politely ask you to fill it out and be creative. It's all good fun. Um, the second part is when you bid, it's like a silent auction, you bid on the different events. And we'll have tables all around and you can do the bidding. Well, let me tell you something. Since I've done this and since I've participated and attended many events, number one, we help our center, our center, you know, with bills and stuff. Number two, you are able to interact with others in the center. Maybe people that you just have seen, but you've never talked to. You know, this is a chance to maybe interact with them and have really good fellowship. And number three, well, I can only talk from my own personal experience. You know, at my age, my social life is not like it used to be. I don't do the bar hopping or go to discotheques, or that was in my youth, not yours, um, or any of that. So guess what? I have a wonder, wonderful social life because of this, these events. And it is all so much fun. You play games, you dance, maybe you walk a labyrinth, you hike, you swim in Lake Me, I don't know. There are so, so many things to do. So I invite you, I invite you, to have some fun, to support the center, and either host or bid and go to, or both, Gourmets for God. Really, really important and really fun. Thank you so much. Thank you, Theo. So we're especially interested this year in those of you who have never hosted, to just consider it. And, and if you're kind of on the court, in the courtyard walking over toward the great room, the table's right outside the open glass wall. Talk to the people at the table. They can help you with some ideas and that kind of thing. I was having a bit of a, of a wrestling with my own ideas for two events that we want to host, and so Judy was very helpful in that regard as well. So go over, because they want to get this all complete, all the hosts uh, in place by Wednesday, I believe, of this week. Yes, Judy will be in a, in a dilemma if we wait till next Sunday, but if you have to, to put some things in order, that's okay, but as much as possible by this Wednesday. So go over and talk to them today. It would be wonderful to have your participation and some, some fresh ideas happening in this wonderful, wonderful event. So thank you. All right. So now we're going to end our service with prayer. Uh, this is our way of just reminding ourselves that there is one creative presence in the universe, and it is at work in our lives all the time. So I invite you to just be ready to have that experience be opening up of your own consciousness and your own presence. So if you would with me take in a deep breath, let that breath out. If it is your custom to close your eyes in spiritual practice, I invite you to do that. And we just remember, we remember together that there is one power, one presence, one intelligence in the universe. I call it God, though it is known by many names and by no name. 
It is that which created everything in the beginning. And it created this everything from its own substance. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There was only God when time and space began. And this physical universe has come from that one that is God, made of God, made in its image and likeness. That means everything and everyone in the universe is an expression, a reflection of God. And just as our lives reflect our thoughts, the life of God is reflected in us. And so I unify myself with that. As I stand here, I stand in the truth of all being, therefore the truth of my being, God. It's who and what I am. And this is not an ego exercise. This is stating a powerful, profound, and eternal truth. It is true of all creation. Therefore, it is true of everyone within the sound of my voice at any time. It's true everywhere, always. And so as I accept that, I can accept the truth for us, the truth for our lives. And that is the perfect reflection. As within, so without. On earth, as it is in the heaven of our own consciousness. That is the reality that we inhabit. And as we come together here and remember that that is the way that our lives work, we are then able consciously to make adjustments as necessary to effect positive difference in our world. All it takes is a willing heart, a mind that can say yes. And the law of being takes hold of it and transforms the outer because the inner has transformed. How wonderful it is to know this. It's a simple, powerful truth. And though it's not always easy to practice, it is pure and it is right. And we accept it right here and right now. I accept it with gratitude, with gratitude for the gathering of souls this morning, for this center and all centers, for all houses of worship where God is known and celebrated and practiced. I give thanks for a changing world, changing for the better, because we are committing to living larger lives. And I'm grateful for this center and its work in my life and in the world. Because as we say yes, as we continue to come together and live and remember and practice, our world benefits. This is good, and I'm grateful. And I surrender my word in this prayer into that magnificent law that always works and that is always at work. It has hold of this. As we realign with the truth of our being, it simply says yes and brings it forth into our experience in greater ways. And so we let go of the prayer right now together by saying, and so it is. I am letting go of the things that no longer serve me as I'm letting go. God's revealed and I am whole. I am letting go of the things that no longer serve me as I'm letting go. God's revealed and I am whole. I am feet as we're able. We're going to finish together by singing, I release. I release and I let go. I let the spirit run my life. And my heart is open wide. Yes, I'm only here for God. No more struggle, no more strife. With my Go! Oh. 
out on either side of you. Take a hand. We connect hand to hand and heart to heart one final time in this room. Please say after me, something wonderful is happening as me right now. It is this thing called life. Life is in my mind. Life is in my body. Life is in everything I do. I am it. I receive it. I share it. And I accept it, just the way that it is, and just the way that it becomes. Thank you, life. Amen.